us here at Upper Room Family International Church. 2024 has been declared our year of service and we just want to encourage you this year to embark on the journey of living for Christ, fulfilling purpose, and serving God in humanity with excellence. Don't forget to share this link as we gather together today in the spirit of service. We hope you enjoy and we hope you have a special encounter with God through his word. Worthy. And you are greatly to be praised. We come before your holy presence with a heart that seeks. We pray that you fill our mouths. We come with our mouths wide open that you feed us and help us that we might walk in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please sit. So we started... The book of Nehemiah, um, we've gone through the first nine chapters. The burden of Nehemiah that led to a project, it looked at first like a construction project. But at this point, it begins to look like an awakening. It look, begins to look like an awakening where the people are confronted with the word of God. And in response to that word, they repent. And then at the end of um, the last chapter, they wept. They wept when they heard the law. And then they decided in this chapter, chapter number 10 that we enter, they decide to enter into a covenant. A covenant. Uh, much of chapter 10 is a listing of names. Um, but it's all about the people, the people who, who signed or who, who, who appended their name, the leaders who appended their name to this covenant. So Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 1. Now, those that sealed were, and it begins by mentioning Nehemiah the governor, Nehemiah the Teshata, which is another way of saying the governor, and um, Zedkija, Hakaliah and Zedkija. And then following from verse 2 all the way through verse 27, it lists names, the names of people who who appended their names to this agreement, this vow, covenant. Verse 28, after the listing, it says, And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the Levites, we've already described who they are, the descendants of Levi, the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who, 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 who was himself also a Levite, the porters, the singers, the nethinims. The nethinims were servants in the temple. Servants in the temple. They, they assisted the Levites in their duties. And all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God. All they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, and everyone having knowledge and having understanding, everyone old enough to have understanding was involved in this. Verse 29, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse. Who enters into a curse? They entered in, so strongly did they feel about what needed to be done that they said, we are cursed if we don't do this. And into an oath. And what was the oath? So they swore, in other words. They swore to walk in God's law. Now that God's law had been read and explained to them, 
they swore an oath to walk in God's law. God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God, the Lord our Lord, and his judgments and its statutes. One thing we note here is that, again, they were united. They were united in building the wall. And here we find that they were united in their response to the word of God. When they gathered to hear the word read, we read that they gathered together as one man. As one man. So they were united in making this commitment. Um, and Jesus, that's what Jesus prayed for, for, for us who follow. That we might be one. In John chapter 17. John 17 from verse 20, Jesus' prayer, I am praying not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me because of them and their witness about me. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind. One heart and mind. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So, in the same way, let them be one in heart and mind with us. One in heart and mind with us. That was Jesus' prayer. And then he says that then, then, as a result of that, the world will believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them. So they'll be unified and together as we are. I in them and you in me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and love them in the same way you've loved me. That was what we see here in this great awakening, that they were unified. They were unified. So we read that they swore an oath. They made a vow. They made a vow. Um, what is a vow? A vow. A vow is... The noun form is a solemn promise. A solemn promise. A vow can also be a verb to declare or to make an assertion. But the Bible tells us something about, about vows. It tells us something about vows. In Deuteronomy 23 and 21. We read that when you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not put off doing what you promise. The Lord will hold you to your vow, and it is a sin not to keep it. It is a sin not to keep it. In other words, let's not rush into vows of any kind. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 4, Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 4, read that when thou vowest, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. Defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. In other words, a person who makes a vow and does not keep it is yeah, reckoned as a, a fool. He hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. It is better not to vow at all than to vow and not keep the vow. That's what we get, gather from these. Um, when we make a vow to the Lord, 
the Lord expects us to keep it. In the Bible, there are covenants. Covenants. What is a covenant? What's a covenant? Yes, an agreement. A covenant is a, it's an agreement. It's not just, a, not just another agreement. It is binding. A covenant is a binding agreement. In um, the, the root for the word covenant is um, in, in the, the Latin, con venire, a coming together, coming together, a binding agreement. And we see covenants throughout the scriptures. God made a covenant um, with the children of Israel. In Exodus chapter 24, We read about a covenant God made with the children of Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Come up the mountain to me, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 of the leaders of Israel. And while you are still some distance away, bow down in worship. You alone, none of the others, are to come near me. The people are not even to come up the mountain. Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances. And the people answered together, We will do everything the Lord has said. Moses wrote down all the Lord's commands. Early the next morning, he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent the young men and they burned sacrifices to the Lord and sacrificed some cattle as fellowship offerings. Moses took half the blood of the animals, put it in bowls, and the other half he threw up against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, in which the Lord's commands were written, and read it aloud to the people. And the people said, in other words, the people agreed, we will obey the Lord and do everything he has commanded. They say, then Moses took the blood in the bowls and threw it on the people. So half against the altar, half on the people. They said, this is the blood that seals the covenant. This is the blood that seals the agreement which the Lord made with you when he gave you all these commandments. So with this covenant, there was a blood. That sealed the covenant. Some covenants are sealed with blood. And um, some people also engage in blood covenants. Where essentially two lives are mingled together. A covenant is a serious thing. It's a binding agreement. In Matthew 26, 28, Jesus says, For this is my blood of the new and the better covenant. This is the blood which ratifies the covenant and is being poured out for many as a substitutionary atonement for the forgiveness of sins. The covenant we have with God is a new covenant. Here we are told it is a better covenant. And it is sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by that blood, we are made, we, we are made at one. We are reconciled. The substitutionary atonement for the forgiveness of sins. So... There's this covenant in the New Testament, and there are a bunch in the Old Testament. Regarding the New Covenant, in um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when the Messiah arrived, the high priest 
of the superior things of this new covenant. Jesus, the Messiah, is a, our high priest. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But when the Messiah arrived, high priest of the superior things of the new covenant, he bypassed the old tent and its trappings. in this created world and went straight to the heaven's tent, the true holy place, once and for all. He also bypassed the sacrifices consisting of a goat and calf blood, instead using his own blood as a price to set us free once and for all. If that animal blood and other rituals of purification were effective in cleaning up certain matters of our religion and behavior, think how much more the blood of Christ cleans up our whole lives, inside and out. Through the Spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice, freeing us from those dead-end efforts to make ourselves respectable so that we can live all out for God. So that we can live all out for God. In verse 20, Hebrews 9.20. Saying, this is the blood of the covenant that seals and ratifies the agreement which God ordained and commanded me to deliver to you. So our relationship with God is based upon this new covenant. And like we read at the end of verse 11, all of this is done so that we can live all out for God. All out for God. Joshua challenged, just before he left the scene, he challenged the children of Israel to also live all out for Jehovah. And and they agreed. They also agreed. When we go to Joshua 24 and verse 14. Now then, Joshua continued, honor the Lord and serve him sincerely and faithfully. Get rid of the gods which your ancestors used to worship in Mesopotamia and in Egypt and serve only the Lord. If you are not willing to serve him, decide today whom you will serve. The gods your ancestors worshipped in Mesopotamia or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for my family and me, we will serve the Lord. Then the people replied, we would never leave the Lord to serve other gods. Verse 17, the, 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 um, they go on. The Lord our God brought our fathers and us out of slavery. And we saw the miracles he performed. He kept us safe wherever we went among all the nations through which we passed. As we advanced into this land, the Lord drove out the Amorites who lived there. So we will serve the Lord. He is our God. Joshua said to the people, but you may not be able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God, and he will not forgive your sins. He will tolerate no rivals. And if you leave him to serve um, serve foreign gods, he will turn against you and punish you. He will destroy you, even though he was good to you before. Verse 21, the people said to Joshua, no. No. We will serve the Lord. That is the determination that came with the covenant that they made. Joshua told them, you are your own witnesses to the fact that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they said, we are witnesses. If we have chosen to serve the Lord, verse 23, then get rid of those foreign gods that you have. Get rid of those foreign gods that you have, he demanded. 
and pledge your loyalty to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people then said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God. We will obey his commands. This is exactly where, this is exactly where the children of Israel in Nehemiah are saying. And they say it with the force of an oath. With the force of an oath and the force of a curse if they should renege on their vow. Our covenant is an everlasting covenant. It's not a short-term covenant. In Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. The blood of the, this covenant that reconciles us to God is everlasting. And he prays, the author of Hebrews prays, may the God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you, working God himself working in you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The people who made this vow, they had separated themselves. They had separated themselves. When we go back to verse 28 of Nehemiah 10, the rest of the people, priests, Levites, security guards, singers, temple staff, that's the Nathanians, temple staff, and all who separated themselves from the foreign neighbors, the foreign neighbors to keep the revelation of God. In order to keep the revelation of God, they had to separate themselves. And in this instance, it had to do with intermarriages which would tend to draw them from God, draw them away from God. They separated themselves together with their wives, sons, daughters, everyone old enough to understand. All joined their noble kinsmen in a binding oath. The binding oath means a covenant, a binding oath to follow the revelation of God the law of God, given through Moses, the servant of God, to keep and to carry out all the commitments of God, our master, all his decisions and signs, all, all, as they read, as they had, as had been read to them, all, and we'll go through some of the aspects of it. Thus, we will not marry our daughters to our foreign neighbors, nor let our sons marry their daughters. Because intermarriage was one source of their being drawn towards idolatry. So separation was something that God kept calling the children of Israel onto. Separation. Separation. And we'll read a couple of examples. In Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus 20 from verse 22. It says, you shall keep, you shall therefore keep all my statutes, all my judgments, and do them all. And that, that the land where I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. Verse 23. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. You can't copy the nations around you. For they committed all these things, therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit the land. I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from us. God himself has separated you from us the nations around. And he shall be holy unto me. 
To be holy unto me also means to be separated unto me. To be separated unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy. I, Jehovah, am holy. And I have severed you. I have cut you off from other people. That you should be mine. That you should be mine. In Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. We read, the Lord your God will bring you into the land that you are going to occupy. And he will drive, uh, he will drive many nations out of it. As you advance, he will drive out seven nations larger, more powerful than you. The Hittites, the Gegashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. When the Lord your God places these people in your power to defeat them, you must put them all to death. Do not make an alliance with them or show them any mercy. Do not marry any of them and do not let your children marry any of them. And the reason is given in verse 4. Because they would lead your children away from the Lord to worship other gods. Because they would lead your children away from the Lord to worship other gods. If that happens, the Lord will be angry and, uh, with you and destroy you at once. So then, tear down their altars. Break their sacred stone pillars in pieces. Cut down their symbols of the goddess Asherah. And burn their idols. Why? Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. That's what the separation means. For all the peoples of the earth, from all the peoples of the earth, he chose you to be his own special people. Does that apply to us in the New Testament? In the New Covenant? Yet, why? And how? Thank you. We've been grafted and also um, reconciled to God. We've al- we also, like the children of Israel, we also have become his own special people. And, and we are told explicitly to separate ourselves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The next chapter, verse, first verse of the next chapter. Having therefore these promises, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. How can we separate ourselves in this world? How is it possible? We don't have our own world. We live in the world. How does it work in practice? How can we be separate unto God? By living holy lives. By living holy lives. So we are not told that we are not told that we should separate ourselves in a literal sense. But 
in dedicating ourselves to those things that God will have us dedicate ourselves to, we become separate unto him. We become uh, his own special people because he belongs, he, God is apart. He's apart from everything and all. And he wants us to also be apart and separated unto him. So, one of the things they, they noticed as the, the, word, the Old Testament was read to them was the Sabbath. So they committed themselves to keeping the Sabbath. They committed themselves to keeping the Sabbath. They committed themselves to making the sacrifices. They committed themselves to giving so that there will be bread in the temple. They committed themselves to so many things because these things had been read out to them. The Sabbath. In Nehemiah 10.31, they said, When the foreign neighbors bring goods or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we won't trade with them. It means that on the other days, they will trade with them. right? But on the Sabbath, because the Lord commanded that they should observe the Sabbath. We won't trade with them, not on the Sabbath or any other holy day. Not during, in the sabbatical month, they observed Yom um, Kippur, they observed Rosh Hashanah, they observed Sukkot. Not on any of those holy days and not on the Sabbath. And then they also said every seventh year we would leave the land fallow. We'll leave the land, let the land rest. And there are good reasons for letting the land rest. And then we'll cancel all debts. We'll cancel. These are things that they had just read. We can look at the, the verses that speak to those. In Exodus chapter 16, the Lord provided manna. And then he said, Every day you are going to get, go gather the manna. But on the sixth day, take a double portion. Um, because on the seventh day, there will be no manna. Um, that when we read from verse 23. He said unto them, This is that which the Lord had said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today. Sieve that which you will sieve, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Verse 27. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day to gather, and they found none. Verse 28. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandment and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Verse 30. So, as a result of this experience, the people rested on the seventh day. So they noted that the seventh day was supposed to be a day of rest, a day dedicated to the Lord. Deuteronomy 15, verse 1 to 3, also talks about death cancellation in the seventh year. At the end of every seventh year, cancel all debts. Cancel all debts. I guess it would be smart to go and borrow in the sixth year. <laughs> At the end of every seventh year, cancel all debt. This is the procedure. Everyone who has lent money to a neighbor writes it off. You must not press your neighbor or his brother for payment. All debts are canceled. God says so. You may collect payment from foreigners... 
but whatever you have lent to your fellow Israelite, you must write off. So that's why they said, we will cancel all debts on the seventh year. Every seventh year, we'll cancel all debts. So does the Sabbath apply to us? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There remaineth a rest to the people of God, a day of rest. Um, For he that entered, he that is entered into his rest, that first word rest, um, katapos Greek, it's not, it's not the same as this, this other rest, um, the sabbatismos, sabbatismos, which means a Sabbath rest. There's a certain Sabbath rest that we enter into by faith. If we enter into this Sabbath rest by faith, we have ceased from our own works, just as God ceased from his own works. On the seventh day, God rested, we are told. And as we enter into the rest that is accessible only by faith, we too cease from our works. We cease from our own works. So in verse 11, we are told, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, that place that we access only through faith, seizing from our own works and resting instead on that which God does. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Unbelief will take us out from the place of rest, the place of rest, and where we hang on to our own works rather than than the works that God works on our behalf. So they vowed to keep the Sabbath. They also vowed to make the different kinds of offerings that were prescribed in the law. In Nehemiah 10 verse 32, We accept responsibility. We accept the responsibility for paying an annual tax of one third of a shekel. We accept the responsibility for paying an annual tax of one third of a shekel, about an eighth ounce, for providing the temple of our God with bread. We accept their responsibility. This has been read to them. And here they vow that they will make sure that the temple of God has bread. The table regular grain offerings, regular whole bent offerings for the Sabbaths, new moons, appointed feasts, dedications offerings, absolution offerings, to atone for Israel, maintenance of the temple of our God, all the offerings. They are dedicating themselves to all of it. They were going all out. Verse 34, we, that is the priests, the Levites, and the people, have cast lots to see each of our families, when each of our families will bring wood. The sacrifice requires burning. In their tent, there will be a roster. They will bring wood for burning on the altar of our God, following the yearly schedule as set down in the law, in the revelation. So what were some of these offerings? There was what is known as the show bread. The show bread. In Leviticus 24, verse 5 to 9, 
take fine flour and bake 12 loaves of bread using about four quarts of flour to a loaf. Arrange them in two rows of six each on the table of pure gold before God. Allow each row spread, along each row spread pure incense, marking the bread as a memorial. It is a gift to God. Regularly, every Sabbath, this bread is to be set before God. A perpetual covenantal response from Israel. The bread then goes to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in the holy place. It is the most holy share. It is their most holy share from the gifts of God. This is a perpetual decree. It was in the law and they've committed themselves to keep it. The bread set before God. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry. And anyone who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty. For that one will be sustained spiritually. That one will be satisfied spiritually. Then there's also the grain or the meal offering. The meal offering. In Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1, when you present a grain offering to God, Use fine flour, pour oil on it, put incense on it, and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. One of them will take a handful of fine flour and oil with all the incense and burn it on the altar for a memorial, a fire gift, a fire gift, a pleasing fragrance to God. That's um, a, a theme that recurs pleasing aroma to God. The rest of the grain offering is for Aaron and his sons, a most holy part of the fire gifts to God. Grain offering, the grain offering. One more reading on the grain offering. In Leviticus 6, from verse 14, these are the instructions for the grain offering. Aaron's sons are to present it to God in front of the altar. The priest takes a handful of fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and its incense, and burns this as a memorial on the altar, a pleasing fragrance to God. Aaron and his sons eat the rest of it. It is unraised bread, unleavened bread, bread that doesn't um, 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 what does yeast do? It, it causes the bread to bloat, right? Rise. And un- un- raised bread here refers to bread that is not um, um, risen or fermented. And so eaten in a holy place, in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. They must not bake it with yeast. They must not bake it with yeast. We are told in the New Testament, the little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. I've designated this as a share of the gifts to be presented to me. It is a very holy, like the absolution offering, the compensation offering. Any male descendant of Aaron's sons may eat it. This is a fixed rule regarding God's gifts, stretching down the generations. Anyone that touches these offerings must be holy. Then there were burnt offerings, sin offerings. The sin offering was compulsory. The sin offering... That's, that's where the, on, on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, the sin of the whole nation gets um, atoned for. Um, but then there's also sins of individuals may, may, do, may do same. But there are other of these offerings that are free will offerings, the bent offerings. Bent offerings. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 3. If the offering is a whole bent offering from the head, present a male without a defect at the entrance of the tent of the meeting that may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the head of the whole bent offering so that it may be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. It's as though laying your hand on the the offering makes the animal represent, represent the, the person who lays hands on it. 
slaughtered the bull in God's presence. Aaron's sons, the priests, will make an offering of the blood by splashing it against the sides of the altar that stands at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. Next, skin the whole burnt offering and cut it up. Aaron's sons, the priests, will prepare a fire on the altar, carefully laying out the wood, then arrange the body parts, including the head and the sewer. The sewer being the fat, the raw, um, hard fat. On the wood prepared for the fire, scrap the entrails, the entrails meaning the inner parts, and legs clean. The priest will burn it all on the altar. A whole burnt offering, a fire gift, a pleasing fragrance to the Lord. It's as though the point of it, yes, is atonement. But unto God, it's a fire gift, a pleasing fragrance unto God. Does that apply to us in the new order? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2. We are told in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. A sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So Christ It's our sacrifice. We are told in Corinthians, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. They also dedicated themselves to giving, making sure that there was bread in the house. In verse 35 of Nehemiah chapter 10, they say, we take responsibility. These are the things they were taking a solemn oath, a binding agreement for. We take responsibility for delivering annually to the temple of God the first fruits of our crops and our orchard. Our firstborn. They also read that the firstborn, the first male, uh, born male, belongs to the Lord. The, The firstborn of their sons, as well as their cattle. The firstborn of their heads and their flocks for the priests who serve the temple of our God. Just as it was, it is set down in the law, in the revelation. The first fruit, the best, the first fruit. We will bring the best, verse 37. We will bring the best. No, we're we're right there in Nehemiah 10. We'll bring the best of our grain, of our contributions. Of, of, of the fruit of every tree, of wine and of oil to the priests in the storerooms of the temple of our God. We will bring the tithes from our fields to the Levites, since the Levites are appointed to collect the tithes in the towns where we work. We will see to it that a priest descended from Aaron will supervise the Levites as they collect the tithes and make sure that they take a tenth of the tithes to the treasury in the temple of our God. We we'll see too that the people of Israel and Levites bring the grain, wine, oil to the storage rooms where the vessels of the sanctuary are kept and where the priests will serve. The security guards, the choir meet. We will not neglect the temple of our God. We will not neglect the temple of our God. First fruits. So where did they get this from? In Deuteronomy 26, verse 2 and verse 3. 
that thou shalt take the first of all the fruit of the earth, the first, the ones that pop out first, which thou shalt bring of thy land to the Lord, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt put it in a basket, and thou shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there, and thou shalt go unto the priest, unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers to give unto us. The first fruit. So in Proverbs 3, verse 9, we are told, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first. So shall thy bands be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And then there were also the tithes. Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Second Chronicles 31, verse 5. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, oil, honey, and all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. In the New Testament, we are told, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of, of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, according as God hath prospered every one of us, that there be no gatherings when I come. The first day of the week. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, not compulsion, not, not as if you are being pressed to do it. For God loveth a cheerful giver. God loveth a cheerful giver. It's almost as if you are going to give. Be cheerful about it. Be cheerful about it. And we are told, we are told in the previous chapter, Chapter 8 and verse 7. As we are bound, as we grow in all the dimensions, as you are bound in everything, as you are bound in faith, as you are bound in utterance, as you are bound in knowledge, as you are bound in all diligence and service and your love to us, see that you are bound in this grace also. The grace of giving. So you're bound in everything else. See that you are bound also in this grace. So the children of Israel swore that they were going to do all, everything that was written in the law. And they wept in the previous chapter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, we read that godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. If the sorrow leads to salvation, that's of God. If the sorrow leads to death and depression, that's not of God. Because God has made a way for us in his beloved. 
For behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed not after you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Clear in this matter. Mark 12, 33. And to love him, the Lord, with all the heart. That's what they they were sworn to do. To love the Lord with all the heart. With all the understanding. With all the soul. With all the strength. And to love his neighbor as himself. This is more than all whole bent offerings and sacrifices. It's more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. The words of our Lord. So, this is an awakening. They built a wall, but that was only the beginning. They were coming to the place where they were dedicating themselves to the service and to the worship of the Lord. The way the Lord designed it. So, well, the last verse we'll read for this evening in Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. In view of God's mercy, I beg you. The previous verse, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. Then he goes on to say, because of that, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. We can't do burnt offerings, but we can present our bodies a living sacrifice. Separate. Separate. Holy, that means separate. Acceptable unto God which is our reasonable service. Reasonable means it makes sense. It makes sense. That's your reasonable act of worship. And be not conformed to this world because you are separate. If the world does something that is not consistent with the revealed word of God, we don't copy them. But as we listen to the word like the people in Nehemiah's day listen to the word. Let us allow that word to transform us. That our thinking should be along the lines of God's will, not along the lines of the wider society around us. But when we do that, we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Any comments? Any um, contributions? Yes, Pastor. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. Colossians 2, 16. An additional thought to the Sabbath. They respecting certain days and they said they wouldn't do business and all of that. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon of the Sabbath day. So somebody may choose to go adhere to what is prescribed in the Old Testament. I have, I have some dear Seventh-day Adventists. Um, we are, I'm not better to, uh, be, than them because I don't, I don't, I eat, I don't observe that. that. Um, and they are not be- better than me, the, based on my understanding on that basis. Um, so, 
That's why we read the verses from the New Testament. That's why we read it. So our dedication to God is as a living sacrifice. Our dedication to God is as a living sacrifice. Any other thought? Oh, he's right there. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. So obviously a big thing that non-Christians will bring up is evolution. I was wondering what we say to non-Christians when, when they say we don't believe because of evolution and, and what we can say to them and what, what we can convince them of. Yeah. So evolution is, is a theory. It doesn't negate the word of God. The word of God, if, if something... Something can come out of nothing. You can get something coming out of nothing. Um, so that there had to have been something for something to grow out of, and that's a whole other, a whole topic that we can, we can, we understand that through, we understand through faith that God made the heavens and the earth. Um, we see still pictures in the new, in the new, in, in Genesis. We don't see a movie. We don't see every detail of what God did. But we do know that God made the heavens and the earth. If you say that a bigger animal came out of a smaller, uh, of, uh, um, out of another species, there isn't a lot of proof of macro evolution. And that what there is is that there are slight changes. Right, there, there are slight changes. Um, it, it, it's a theory. It doesn't negate the word of God. And um, yeah, there are so many things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then at a the time, God made time. There was a time when there was no time. So when you, when you say so many, 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 many years, in our Bible terms, there was timelessness ahead of that. But we understand through faith, not only in Genesis, throughout the whole Bible, it is said again and again and again that God made the heavens and the earth and, and all things seen and unseen. So that is our faith. Um, yes, that's all. Sunday, whatever we believe as Christians is based on the authority of scriptures. So that's our stand in everything. Like we read in 1 Corinthians 15 on Sunday that Christ died according to the scriptures. He resurrected according to the scriptures. So our stand in everything is based on scriptures. There are some arguments uh, out there, including evolution. That is all based on, like he said, theory. Our total belief of everything, there is a dimension of it that is f a faith thing. And that you cannot justify that, you cannot argue that out. For example, if we said that God created Adam and somebody out there asked you that where was the woman? It has to take a man and a woman to, 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 to bring forth somebody. It is based on faith. Our, it's authority of the scripture. So there is a place in some of these arguments where we can never agree with them and they may also never agree with us. Yes, everything we believe is based on the authority of scriptures, not necessarily common sense or theory out there. And the moment, if we are not careful and we shift then again, like I was saying on Sunday, then our debate is based on what the creation, which is the human being, is saying, as opposed to God, which one do we believe? Yeah. yeah. But, but uh, so there, there's, an, there's, throughout church history, there's this whole tension about, um, you know, it's all, it's my faith. This is what I believe. And, and that's it. And there's also that school that says, 
I must make the case that it makes sense to believe. It makes sense to believe. And so, so there are, throughout the ages, there have been apologists, people who, who um, are skilled in reasoning some of these things out. Um, and we've had, we've had some notable people who, who, who are well-versed in how to, uh, what they call it, apologetics, right? Um, I don't have that skill, but I have some basic um, understanding of biology and a basic understanding of what the Bible says, and the two are not contrary one to the other. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we give you praise. We thank you for your word. We pray for this great awakening in our midst. We pray for this great awakening in the body of Christ in our time. We pray that you help us to come to the place where we rededicate ourselves to all that is revealed in your word, that we might be faithful. We thank you for your spirit. We pray for as we leave here that we continue to meditate on these things. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. We want to thank you all for watching today's service and hope you have been blessed by God's word. If this is your first time tuning in with us, we ask that you connect with us on Instagram at Earthic and also Facebook at Upper Room Family International Church. Don't forget to subscribe to the Earthic YouTube channel and click that post notification button so you do not miss any new videos. And if you would like to give a kind contribution to the Earthic family, you can visit us at earthic.org slash give. If you accepted life with Christ during today's service, I ask that you send us a direct message through our social medias or earthrick.org. Once again, we want to thank you so much for tuning in and we hope to see you soon. God bless.